So who would like to start? It would be nice if you can also introduce yourself. We'll get to, we want to get to know our community okay. and new, especially the newer members of the community. Sure, yeah. sure. Hi, my name is Nina Venkatraman. I am an English PhD student. I'm also a summer fellow um, with the Saxena Center. Um, thank you so much. Your film was fascinating. I appreciated the class conscious perspective. Um, and kind of on that note, I was wondering, I assume you were not the interviewer, correct? Yeah, or you, I you was. Were? Okay. So um, in terms of your, in like, your relationship as an interlocutor with the subjects, how did that change or um, did you perceive any tension when you asked them what cast they were? And I noticed you asked at the end um, of each interview after you had got their perspective. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious, I guess, as the interviewer, what your intention was with that question and then how they reacted to it and how that might have changed um, the overall, I I guess, the, the tension or the dynamic you had with the subjects? So um, I basically started asking the cast question because along the way, as I was filming and talking to people, I realized that uh, the upper castes were the ones who actually wanted the temple, uh, uh, the mosque demolished and a temple built. And the uh, Dalits and the OBCs, the other backward castes, so-called, uh, were were not part of this. Uh, they didn't have this ideology. So I wanted to bring it out for the audience what this meant. So I I would let people speak first, and then I would ask them the caste, so that you got a correlationship between what they were saying and where they came from. Can I? So in, in those days, by the way, we're talking about 1990. That's uh, 34 years ago. People were not very vocal about, or were not analyzing caste very much at all. Uh, so it was an odd, uh, it was an odd thing to do as a filmmaker. But in reality, in a place like UP, caste was very, very many caste, uh, people's awareness of caste was very clear. So so I just wanted to underline that. Was there any embarrassment on the part of the subjects? Because I noticed there was the one um, man who lied, like he said he was forward caste, and then his friend said, no, that he's backward yeah. caste. Yeah, so, so by this time, by this time already in India, the Mandal Commission, uh, had had been implemented by the, the VP Singh government. Uh, you know, Dalits have had reservations in India right from independence onwards. Uh, but the other backward castes who were slightly higher than the Dalits uh, did not have representation or reservation. And there was a movement to... Uh, to to at actually the level, at the national level, the national level. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, that's that's exactly why um, that mundialization process was beginning. Can I add some social science to this art yeah, art please. point, artistic point? And yeah. you can see why we engage in this exercise that social scientists and humanists should and artists should talk. So by twenty nineteen. Um, uh, the BJP, Mr. Modi, incidentally, is not in the picture. Ramon Mahajan is there because he was a functionary, a junior functionary at that time. He was very involved, right? He was a junior functionary at that time. Ramon Mahajan was senior, so Ramon Mahajan is standing next to Advani in the film. Right? Um, and Bal Thakre is there of, of, from Mumbai. Now, uh, by 2019, 44% of OBCs of India, voters, voted for BJP, and 33% of Dalits voted for BJP. So there was a huge transformation from this point where it was primarily upper caste, right? And of course, 70% of uh, upper caste voted for BJP in 2019. So it became much more cross-caste by 2019, but the story doesn't end there. In 2024, many of the OBCs and Dalits 
did not vote, who had earlier voted for BJP, did not vote for BJP. Hence, you had the result for um, not entirely because of that, but that was the principal reason why BJP came down from 303 to 240. Okay, so there's these ups and downs there. But in 1990, Mandal Commission's announcement essentially meant that most of the OBCs were going to be with the Mandal platform, not the so-called Mandir platform. 2014 and 19 different, and then there's a still now a, a, some steps backward. from. So ba basically, um, the BJP learned from its own mistakes and learned from the criticism. So the criticism in this film is that the upper caste, it's an upper caste-led movement, doesn't have the support of the working class or the uh, lower castes. But the BJP quickly learned that in, in the beginning, in 1990 and earlier, the BJP were violently opposed to the Mandal Commission. Right. For that matter, even the Congress was opposed to the Mandal Commission. But uh, the BJP is violently, in fact, many people set themselves on fire. Uh, in they did self-immolation to protest against reservations being granted to the other backward castes. But, by, but after this moment, the BJP quickly started to mobilize amongst the other backward castes and, and Dalits to some extent. Other questions? Yes, yeah, we, we, we're getting in the microphone. Yeah. Hello, I'm Nizama. Um, I watched it for the second time and it's still very like tension and anxiety but it seems because I grew up in India. Which um, part of the university are you with? Uh, Department of Religious Studies, second year. I study Islam in South Asia. So, okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, my question is more of a technical question. I'm wondering how big your team was. What was the, you know, like, what was uh, the subjects who were looking at you? Were they looking at you or maybe two more people? Or was it like a big team? Was there some anxiety regarding that? And the second part of my question would be, I see the narrator, I'm not sure if it's you, speaking or expressing their opinion only once when you speak to Larga saying that you are talking about love and peace and there are less people following you. And on all the other occasions, I see a rather neutral like interlocutor. So was that a conscious choice uh, in building the narrative in the film or was it just a moment of relating with your subject? So these are the two parts of my question. Okay, so the crew was just two people uh, on, on the shoot. There was me doing camera and asking the questions and there was my friend Parvez who was recording the sound. So just two of the crew on the spot. But I mean, we also filmed in other parts uh, uh, like in Mumbai and then there was a, again, the crew was always never more than three people. Uh, yeah, so so um, my mm, everything in the film is pretty spontaneous. Nothing is predetermined in terms of there's no script. Uh, I haven't gone there. I didn't talk to people before filming them. I was filming them and talking to them at the same time. So sometimes I lost my cool as you, as on the bridge when they talk about how they're happy that Gandhi was killed. And so, so yeah, and with, with uh, Laldas, um, yeah, we, it, that, was a, that, that interview was done the day of the attack on the mosque. At night, I went back to talk to Laldas. Um, so there was anguish in his in what he was saying. So that the the reason you ended up expressing an opinion as opposed to asking a question on the bridge is that you were that statement that Gotse was right and Gotse yeah. Gotse's killing of Gandhi was right yeah. that you couldn't I you couldn't, couldn't take it you couldn't take it yeah. Don't you get the answer to that question in much more. You, you'll get answer to that question in much more, let's say, affective way in tomorrow's film. Okay. Why Arun got angry? Okay. I would imagine anybody would get angry. Not anybody. Yeah. 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 We have to go on that yeah. side now. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Would you introduce yourself? My I mean, name is Ahna. I'm a PhD student uh, in the anthropology department. Um, I was thinking of one of the last voiceovers in the film um, where what is being spoken about is a certain tempo or rhythm of political upheaval or frenzy or intoxication or madness after which uh, the monsoon kind of ends and, and good sense returns. Yeah. Um, and so I was... Wondering what you thought 34 years later about what about this sort of rhythm of upheaval had hardened or if it was that what counts as good sense has changed? No, I think I think that in the worst moments when I think that, you know, we're headed towards fascism, I do try to console myself by the thought that everything is cyclical, that that times that this moment of despair is not going to be there forever, that things will change. And yeah, so I think what he was expressing at that moment was that out of that particular moment of despair is that the season will change. Let me uh, follow up a little on, on this, on Hona's question. You filmed this in 1990. Yeah. Could you have foreseen at that time that on 6 December 1992, two years or so later, the mosque actually would be torn down? No, actually, the the funny thing was that even in 1990, till the day of the attack on October 30th, uh, we were all being told bec that because Mulayam Singh had... had uh, it was a virtually fortress. Ayodhya was blocked off. And uh, even us had, the two of us who got in, had great difficulty going there as, as even as so-called journalists or people reporting uh, with the camera uh, because they had curfews all over the place. So we felt that, you know, they, they, the BJP is not going to succeed in, in doing this big attack. Uh, and the mosque would be protected. But suddenly we found there were thousands of people who had broken the curfew and had got in, and the police, one section of the police was helping them. Um, then, again, I thought that having this incident having happened on, on October 30th, 30th 1990. That, yeah, 1990, that uh, it, they, the government will take care of it because the government was the secular government, supposedly. Um, not the UP and, government. And the the UP, the not UP, the UP, UP government was Kalyan Singh at that time. Yeah. No, but certainly Mulayam the, Singh. No, no, no. I mean, 92. 92, yeah. 92, December 6th. Correct, is correct. So, but when I was filming, it was Mulayam correct. Singh's government. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, 92 happened, and uh, the, in fact, even the film was already completed. Before this happened, we were already showing the film in 91. It was completed sometime in 91. And I remember even at the Mumbai, uh, at the festival in, in Bombay, when I showed the film, I think it was February of 92, uh, I was told by many people that I was just uh, muckraking and I should not show a film like this because I'm going to create divisions amongst people. People have forgotten the incident already. Just let it lie. Don't don't talk about these this Hindu-Muslim fight and this temple thing because it's all okay. Now, don't talk about it. Uh, and that's the thing that it happened in December and, and they succeeded it's because by not talking about it, it doesn't go away. And, and in fact, the government of the day, many governments came and went uh, who, that tried to suppress the film. The film was not allowed. We had trouble in the beginning with the, getting the census certificate. Even after getting the census certificate, then we were trying to get it, we get it broadcast on the national TV. They refused. We took them to court. We finally won the court battle in 1990. We... In 1996, and the film was finally shown on television, reached a lot of people, 
long after the mosque had already been demolished. So the purpose of the film, which was to warn the country about what's going to happen, perhaps if they don't wake up in time, was actually lost. Of the four awards for the film, the first came in 92. Then the next two came in 93. And the last one in 96. So 92. So the, on the basis of the 92 National Award, mm. um, we went to court saying that the government has given this award and so how can you not show it on TV? And we took many years in court and then we won that battle. Next question. It's there. And then after that, we'll go there. Yeah, please go ahead. Marvin, I'm a PhD student in ecology and evolution department. And so there were moments in the film where the atmosphere felt very hostile and just emotionally very charged. Were there like moments during shooting, like the whole entire duration, where you hesitated in interacting with in certain situations or were backed away and this like you know, interactions that never happened? Were, were there moments? Um, I, are you saying it, were you afraid? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's was I, were you afraid was at I, certain moments? Huh? Yeah. Um, you know, basically, not just for this film, but for any film that I make, I do try to be as safe as possible. Uh, not just because I'm afraid, but because um, it's not just me I have to protect. I have to protect the film that we've shot. So and and in those days we were shooting on celluloid, not on not on video. So it was uh, expensive, and was, you you had to protect whatever you already shot. And it was very easy for a mob or anybody to just whack your camera or take away your film or expose it to light. Um, so yeah, we they would we had to take precautions, but you know so. If if I could film something with a zoom lens rather than go right into the middle of the crowd, then I would do that. Uh, but sometimes we were right in the middle of the crowd. Yeah. Uh, my name is Siraj. I'm a PhD student in political theory. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. It's yeah. An amazing film. Um, so sort of similar question. There were, there are times in the interviews where you are sort of pressing the interviewees about the sort of root causes of, of these ideologies, right? Um, and also pressing them on, you know, uh, when was Ron born? Where was Ron born? Sort of asking yeah. these kinds of questions, um, digging into, you know, what are the, what's the, what's the background? Where, who's, and also asking them questions like, who's teaching you these kinds of things? What are they, you know, uh, teaching in school? And what are religious leaders teaching? And so I'm wondering, were there times when you pressed some of these interviewees? Um, maybe uh, even more than was depicted in the, in the film, or there's uh, moments that were cut from some of these interviews, or did you sort of end them at a certain point once you had kind of pressed far enough? Um, and also, how did you determine which of these kinds of questions to ask to bring out those sort of uh, backgrounds? Yeah, so, so basically, um, no, there, again, there's no, no script, so you don't know exactly what people are going to say, and you're bouncing off people's ideas and and introducing your own. And but the central contradiction of knowing the exact spot where Ram is born and having a whole movement to say this is where Ram is born, we're going to demolish this mosque and build a temple in its place, but you don't know where when he was born. I mean you. It could it's prehistory, as everybody said. And so so yeah, once I got that one interview, then I then I looked for because he said, I don't know, no, he said nobody knew. So then I went to the priest, and they're like high priests. The, those two guys who are getting off the Jeep whom I'm talking to are, are like Shankaracharya, one of them <laughs> was. So so which is the highest of the of the uh, priests. So, um, yeah, that was to show that even the high priest didn't know or didn't have any idea. So it's just a logical fallacy. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I, I thought of that because I think that is the one moment that even the believers have to do a double take on when they watch it. For, for the religious... Um 
this is an unimportant question right this the the, the kind of uh, scientific detail you want to bring to this question when was rama born it agitated me a lot when i was studying it you know why, why can't or, and where exactly i went to this place the 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 guide took me to kaushalya's garbhagriha where he precisely the point where kaushalya gave birth to to ram there is kaushalya's chabutra there you know they uh, um, etc so um, but talking to let's say someone like ashish nandi who who studied these you know in a different way he said look uh, pre christian religions if they they exist right they there's no you, it's not it's very hard to figure out when there's some uh, speculation about when buddha was born when mahavira was born but pre buddha pre mahavira where do i where where does it go right so um i think for a scholar it's a very important question and for an artist you know perhaps very important question for the religious i perhaps not yeah i mean it's like asking about how do you know that mary was a virgin correct that's And something how do, you, so yeah. it's a yeah, it's an article of faith yeah how can then, how can the but how all can i wanted I, out, so yeah all i wanted to establish that admit that it's an article of faith and this is not a historical fact right so even even for the origins of christianity you have this question right about about the the immaculate conception and scientifically can't be proved right but does exist as a very sound belief or can be proved otherwise <laughs> rather than yeah other questions yeah hi my name is hari i'm pursuing a masters program here uh, what role did misinformation play then i mean how is it different uh, from today's misinformation uh well that's easy to answer there were no mobile phones then there was misinformation but it was not multiplied to the nth degree as it is today because it's it's now widely circulated misinformation to the extent that people start believing it because it's repeated all the time uh through the internet through all kinds of media especially the phone At the same time, we see in the film also. Um, I should introduce Samantani, <laughs> uh, who's uh, you. You saw her credit in the film as well, in as assistant in those days. I'm just saying that the the machinery of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, was very thought out and sophisticated even at that point. So you see a lot of television being used. right in the beginning the video tape that you showed the very kitschy looking video yeah. tape where they talk about ram being born vhs tape yeah yeah so they were well ahead of anybody else at that point in terms of using the mass media and reaching the public because not many people had televisions or satellite in the satellite had just come in at just coming in so you see these little booths where they're showing the video tape and so it was well ahead in that sense and even in terms of the earlier reference of you know the organizational apparatus you see there is the the bharatiya janata party has one kind of caste cadre the um, and the leadership particularly the vishwa hindu parishad also reflects that upper caste cadre at the same time you have the bajranga which is the working caste and the poorer caste so in terms of the kind of spread through the uh, hierarchy of society is also you see their their thinking which is very exhaustive kind of a thinking it's not something that happened out of belief and spontaneity and people responding to that spontaneity yeah. and there's a movement and also a plan, plan, yeah movement. plan yeah what what i open the film with if you remember the opening shot of yes. the film where the people are gathering to go to ayodhya or they're doing propaganda but the music is actually from the ramayan tv serial now it so happened that the ramayan was broadcast again a congress party government in power doordarshan and national tv is broadcasting this ram story every week people Sunday. stop all the on sundays uh, the whole country comes to a halt watching tv and this ram temple thing starts in on the back of that so you've already the cultural ground has already been set 
because people are now absorbing the Ramayan story. And, and the other point that I make, which is not clear to people who are not familiar, is that in the commentary I point out that the Tulsidas Ramayan, which is the 16th century text, it's only after the, because the Ramayan before that was a Sanskrit Ramayan, which was not accessible to most people. Right. And there are hardly any Ram temples anywhere in the country before the 16th century. Because Ram was not a popular god. It's only after Tulsidas popularized the Ram story that Ram gods, the you know, temples to Ram started to come up. So to claim that this was the place where Ram was born and these are ancient temples is not true. On misinformation, there's a very, it's a huge object of scholarly inquiry today. So we have a seminar coming up on 25th October, but let's return to, to Anand and, and we have a few more minutes uh, before we take you out to chai and samosa and pakora. Uh, so, huh? Pizza. Okay. Not, 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 not samosa. Yeah. Please go ahead. Hello. My name is Anurag. And I was wondering, you talked about how there was like an initial backlash in like the nineties. I was wondering what, if there has been a different reception to it, like in recent years, or do you still receive similar backlash? No, in fact, in 90, see again, 1990s, we didn't have the BJP in power. So the backlash was there, but was, I mean, there was no, there was no uh, violent attacks in those days uh, that I remember. In fact, it's more recent. Uh, now it's especially after the twenty second of uh, uh, of January when the when Modi went to Ayodhya and opened the eyes of God, um, because God was asleep and Modi had to wake him up uh, so it, on on that day uh, just leading up to that and a few days afterwards all over the country people who were secular minded were showing this Ram Kenam were showing and in many places they were attacked and, and over the years that has happened in several places especially universities keep trying to show it and they get attacked um, and yeah, so it's it's uh, the other thing that I, I say to people that in the old days, when the film was shown that they didn't like, they would come to the rooms, uh, to the screenings and argue. They would, they would uh, you know, question, ask questions or even put up their leaflets outside, maybe uh, have, a, have a table outside the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. And that happened even to my screenings abroad, even outside India. Um, we would get followed around by the right wing. But, but over time, they started to realize that some of their people who actually watched the film were having second thoughts. So their strategy now is to tell their people not to watch the film. They, they can attack. There should be an attack mode, but not by going into this, not to go to the screenings and then ask difficult questions, but to just, you know, do a smear campaign. Did you mean political backlash? Backlash in the politics and larger society or backlash against the film? I, I had meant like in terms of um, like the political backlash. So, so, so 1996, BJP came to power. First of all, after the '92 demolition, uh, it was it was it was in four states, ruling in four states, and it was thrown out of all four. Then, 1996, it came to power only for 13 days. It couldn't get a majority. It couldn't get an approval in parliament. In 1998, it came to power, and then that also fell down. Fell the government fell by by 1999. But 99 to 2004, they were in power. But 2014 onwards has been a different era altogether, right? That's a very different kind of but, era. But in and now backlash might have set in, the kind of backlash you, you are mentioning after this election, that might have set in. We don't, we have to watch. We don't know. But in, in Uttar Pradesh, in, in where Ayodhya is located, um, 
after the demolition of uh, after the first attack after when the, when this film was when when we were filming in 1990 after that the bjp did win elections in uttar pradesh so they came to power and in fact when i interviewed pujari lal das the priest um he had bodyguards he because he was already under threat because of what he was saying uh and uh, when i made the film the first screening i did was in lucknow and he came to the screening and he i was worried because i said now you're going to get more attack because you're very visible and you're speaking out in the film and i was worried about that and he laughed he said i'm so happy you made the film and he took cassettes from me they were vhs cassettes and he was showing them he was uh, uh, so he was a very brave person and and he got killed uh, in you know a year after the mosque was demolished because the bjp when they came to power they removed his bodyguards and they threw him out as a temple priest so he became a nobody in terms of uh, he had no uh, political support he had no bodyguards and then they assassinated him yeah so the, i think 1991 state government became bjp government in 93 yeah. it no. couldn't come back and right? lost elections after the dem- demolition of the mosque yeah other questions maybe the last question yeah there I was just wondering if you could say something about the while we were filming, we saw women because we do see two women being interviewed, but they're kind of not in, not where the action is. Ah, the women, the woman, the Dalit woman. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. also the the woman who was saying that over oh, not educated, so we don't know what's going on with the judge. Yeah. Yeah. So both those women are working class. and certainly not in support of the uh, of the temple business one woman says i we don't know what they're saying and the other woman saying no they don't even let us in the temple why should we bother so yes the women are noticeably absent in the film the right wing women and that's another as i said the bjp learns from its own mistakes as they learned about the caste that they had to mobilize not just the upper caste but they had to start mobilizing they also understood that they had to mobilize women and they did they did do that uh today it's very different they you'd have in fact in if they want to do an aggressive action they often put their women at the front ah uh, yeah that that's why yeah that is there was a serious um Uh, in 1990 i was in ayodhya for in december to 1990 and uh, i personally watched i mean she was well known i didn't have to, i don't have to add the fact that i was there sadhvi ritambra was a very important woman leader uh, who was um, who had some of the most uh, how shall i put it vile things to say um about the muslims and how when india had to get rid of them and etc and i went to one of those speeches um um but uh but other than her and one more from madhya pradesh who became uma minister, bharati uma bharati uma. other than them uh, there weren't uh, too many women in the in the, certainly in the front ranks of the movement but but women it's we can tell you from data women in 2014 and 2019 voted in very large numbers for mr modi that number declined recently so in in the most recent elections but in very large numbers they voted for for mr modi that was not true earlier uh, we we can't support that with data that that women were very large supporters of bjp no not earlier which is different from mr trump because i think here at least the women are not on his side at least i hope so no no they're not yeah it's it's uh, the da- the data right now say something like uh, 75 25 I mean, it's, yeah. it's that it's that bad for him yeah I, i think yeah maybe the last comment uh, ashish and then we go to the, go the to ram janm bhumi movement of bjp was a hyper masculine movement that is something that's also spoken a lot about So what you see, what Anand, what you see in the film that follows is men coming 
fundamentally very high for masculinity. There are a few women like uh, Sadi Rikamri uh, and Noam Khatri, but they are, they are the, they're more of the leadership. But people who are actually down, destroying the mosque, are, are very high for masculinity, patriarchal men. And also the uh, at the root of the Hindutva uh, thing is also a, an ancient book called the Manusmriti, which is which lays it down just as they hate the lower caste, they hate women. I mean, it's a completely misogynist book, which is a sacred text for for the right wing Hindutva. It's also perhaps relevant to note, this is truly the last com comment. Uh, no, there's one more after this. Uh, announcement. Gotse defended, uh, didn't hire a lawyer, defended himself. He knew he was going to be executed when he, after he killed Gandhi. So uh, there are two arguments against Gandhi. He says, two reasons I killed. One, he loved Muslims. And how can a Hindu love Muslims so much, especially after what was happening? And especially after 47, August, right? So this is happening in, on 30th January. Right? Second thing he says, another thing I have against uh, Mr. Gandhi is that he's feminizing us Hindus. He says, he says take the, uh, offer the second cheek for the blow. Don't hit back. And he says, men hit back, women take blows. In, in his defense, you can read that text, why I assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. This is the second big argument, that Gandhi was feminizing Hinduism. Masculinity, return of masculinity was very important. But, uh, I, I personally believe uh, that actually Godse's last statement was drafted by Savarkar. Because if you look at Savarkar's style, and you look at that last statement, Godse could not have drafted that. Could not have drafted it. And Savarkar and Godse were part in the same courtroom uh, under the they were they were charged in the same conspiracy. And uh, you know, this is not provable. No. But but I think that it's, Savarkar wrote it. It's plausible but not provable. Right? Yeah. So uh, the tomorrow's film is Vasudev Kutumukam, the world is family, our family. Uh, here in this room at the same time, and then uh, his, uh, then he will. Uh, there's a seminar where he'll uh, analyze work in a different way, right? Uh, and uh, there are two commentators, and Ashish Chadha will be will be um, will be chairing that. And since Savarkar has been mentioned, we should note that the biggest book, at least from the scholarly world, to appear on Savarkar is by Professor Janki Barclay, Professor of History, University of California, Berkeley. And she'll, she's coming here on 21st February for what we call a book adda, where she'll present her book and there'll be three commentators. And, and Tirana Baines is leading that effort on, on behalf of the center. Since Savarkar has been mentioned, you will see a really scholarly treatment. I wish I was there. I don't, yeah. I we, believe We, we can send you the video. I, no, no, I don't know. Yeah. I wish I was there because I don't believe that book is going to be accurate. <laughs> Very can, good. You can then, uh, you can the watch the that, video and send us your comments. Yeah. And we'll pass them on to Janki Barkley. Pr pr presumably, you know Janki Barkley. No, she has a soft spot. She has a blind spot, I would say, because she, she believes that Savarkar was not a casteist. And that is absolutely not true. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful prefiguring of that debate then. <laughs>